Hi everyone. Well, I've got something a little bit different for you today. My youngest son and I gave a technical presentation based on our paper at the 2024 Highway Geology Symposium. This is the second year I've attended this annual event and I really enjoy it. It's really practical. People are very forthcoming about lessons learned and mistakes that they've made in doing research and construction and various other activities associated with supporting roadway and bridge projects throughout the United States. So I'll show this presentation in its entirety. It's related to our experiences with driven piling projects in support of bridge projects and things that really need to be done to improve the state of practice based on our experience. I'll roll credits at the end. I really appreciate those of you who are channel members. That's a excellent way to support the channel. I also want to send a shout out to those of you who provided super thanks. So again, please stay tuned for future videos. Alrighty. Hello everyone. My name is Ronan Jones with Foundation Testing and Consulting. And about a year ago, we wanted to figure out kind of what extent was the, um, to what extent are there what we call mistakes in piling design and construction with bridge projects. Now I'd like to start out with what I mean by mistakes. Now, I'd say this is anything that results in project delays, pile damage, and pile links uh, deviating from plan. So we started out by creating a data set that included about 700 PDA tests. And we found that oftentimes, when you're looking at any uh, individual job, it'll feel like in the mistakes that you might encounter are isolated events. But if you're able to build a big enough data set um, we found that not only are these mistakes uh, occurring on a frequent basis, but the root causes that lead to things like pile damage and um, overrun were often the same thing. So that's what we're going to discuss in this presentation. I'm going to briefly introduce um, some things and then we'll go into the root causes and some case studies. This is an example of what a dynamic pile test would look like. So again, um, those 700 uh, individual PDA tests were across 150 different uh, bridge projects. Now, there's a lot of different um, mistakes that can cause kind of some of these symptoms, but really we wanted to highlight five specific ones based on how common they occurred and kind of the ease of implementing um, the better practice. So, when we took this data set, we wanted to only look at the, uh, the problematic data sets. And so to do this, we began by uh, creating a criterion that was um, instances where pile lengths deviated greater than 15% uh, from plan. And we found that of the 150 bridges, 91 of them met this criteria. And so I think with that, I'll hand it over to my uh, dad and get into some case studies. Hello everyone. You know, I want to say, first of all, this is my second HGS conference that I've been to, and I really like this event. Um, I find it to be very open. People exchange ideas, they share their problems. I won't mention this other organization, but a couple years ago I was at a piling conference and I attended a presentation about a, a case history, which was interesting, about what they did to correct a four foot diameter pipe pile that had crushed in the bottom 10 feet during installation. And of course, it's non-redundant foundation elements, so they were in big trouble. They had to clean all that steel out of there. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. So the presentation was about that, but in, in passing, the presenter mentioned, oh yeah, we, we had done PDA the full drive. And of course, with PDA, you can monitor piling stresses, you can monitor pile damage. So. There was an opportunity for questions and I asked the speaker, I said, well, how is it that the PDA didn't show you incipient pile damage, you know, where you could have stopped before you crushed 10 foot of pile and not be able to extract it very easily? And um, I got a non-answer, I'll just put it that way. Because the, the emphasis was on, hey, look how great we were, we got the, the, all the damaged steel out of there. But I was interested in how do you prevent the problem, you know? So, in these uh, examples, I'm not mentioning any states. You may notice some commonalities. I think many of these things are, are prevalent. 
and it has uh, part, uh, in part to do with kind of the compartmentalization of how the work's done. Sometimes you have some people doing the investigation and a different group doing the design and yet another group responsible for overseeing the installation. So a lot of times uh, people aren't able to avail themselves of institutional knowledge. And so we, what we wanted to do is just show you a few examples. Kyle, there's no KDOT examples in here. I'm not sure how that happened, but. Uh. So the first one I talk about is uh, poor pile capacity verification. So we know with 2007 AASHTO implementation of LRFD, you've got a, a few options for pile, uh, construction phase pile capacity verification. Um, the modified gates formula is largely not used for good reason now. Uh, then you have uh, wave equation analysis and then dynamic pile testing with the PDA. And of course, you can use higher, oops, higher resistance factors with a more accurate verification method. But there's one state in particular recently where they had regularly performed PDA testing and yet we noticed that they've reverted to wave equation verification. And it's, it's again, I think a compartmentalization. Even though LRFD says you can do wave equation, there's an intent behind that that needs to be respected. So for here, here for instance, we have a HP 14 by 73 pile, because of wave equation verification, it's 0.5 fee factor, and so now they need 586 kips. Had that been uh, PDA verification, with the higher fee factor, you could have had a capacity of 451, well within the range of a 12 by 53. So here they are basically, I think, trying to save money on doing wave equations instead of dynamic pile testing, and they're spending way more money on a bigger pile section. Also, what we're seeing is uh, the tendency to, to really drive up the stresses. So in this case, it's less than 20 feet to, to shale bedrock. Now, it's uh, logged as highly weathered shale, and in this particular state for the wave equation submittal, they're looking for, obviously, the pile being driven within allowable stresses, which is 90% of yield, or so you're allowed 45 KSI, but they also want blow counts, ending blow counts in the range of equivalent 30 to 120 blows per foot. Well, the upper red circle shows you we're over at 286 kips, or excuse me, 286 blows per foot, and we're already pushing our max allowable driving stress. So they said, well, look at a bigger hammer so we can get those blow counts down, and our stresses are way over allowable. So there's no Goldie, Goldilocks moment for this situation. And I've actually done a lot of wave equations where I say, don't use this wave equation. In other words, throw it in the trash. And it's, it satisfies a checkbox because they had to do wave equation. And then what do they do in the field? They're, they're not, they don't have any guidance. Sometimes I see these required capacities where if you just take the nominal axial capacity that's required and divide it by the cross-sectional area of the pile, you're getting stresses in the, in the 30 KSI range or more. Well, you have to add, you know, 15 KSI plus for driving stresses. You know, you can't just wish these pile into place. So as a practical matter, I, I, you know, we're just seeing things that aren't really constructible. Recently, I just, uh, last week, I finally ha I had this exact situation and they agreed to do PDA, which was refreshing. But for many other cases, they're just going by some kind of refusal criteria, which is, problematic. If there, anything, if you get one thing from me today is don't use refusal criteria because it's different for everybody. It doesn't factor in the hammer fuel settings. It's, it's meaningless and it can cause you problems. I'm not very opinionated by the way. <laughs> um, so here's another example. We talk about the institutional knowledge and the compartmentalization where if you have consultant design projects, you may have a, you know, 15, 20 different consultants in the course of a year in a given state designing projects. And we were retained to provide dynamic pile testing on this job, 36 inch uh, diameter closed ended pipe pile, so a flat closure plate. This is what the, the sheet looked like. So 627 kips required. These uh, pile links, plan links were 45 feet. They were only gonna have roughly 30 feet of penetration into low 20 blow per foot 
saturated sand. And we had seen in this region instances where excess pour water pressures were developed for piles as small as 16 inches in diameter, where the contractor would have to periodically stop and let those pour pressures dissipate, and then he could resume driving. And so what immediately jumped out to me was, first of all, nobody has ever driven 36 inch closed into pipe pile in this state, in this profile, and wanting these capacities. So the first thing we said is, one, you're going to have trouble putting them in, and two, you're not going to get your capacity at plan length. And uh, nobody listened. At the, the upper box, uh, upper table, that was at plan length. So we needed 600 some kips. We're at 371, just, just like we thought. We actually told him, we think your piling needs to be probably 40 feet longer than planned. The, the bid unit price for piling on this job was $1,000 a foot. And uh, they ended up, well, it, it happened like we said, so we just said, just drive it on down uh, to this lower elevation and we'll come back and test it as a restrike because it was taking them a better part of the day to get these piles advanced. And so that's, that's how it shook out. This uh, plot shows you the initial drive capacity and it was, just, it was just brutal. And the other interesting thing was there was a sister bridge within an eighth of a mile. And so we said, hey, are you gonna do something different on this job? Maybe smaller pile, more pile? Nope, we think maybe the soil's gonna vary. And if you looked at the borings, they were identical. I mean, they could, you could have swapped them. For, and guess what? They did it all again on the second bridge. Here's another one. I mentioned refusal criteria. In this state, they were implementing PDA, but they also go for an inch and 20 set criteria before they'll stop driving. It, it took a lot of convincing to say, well, a quarter inch in five blows is fine. You don't have to hit it you know, for an entire uh, 20 blows to make sure you're under an inch because at this particular job site, they had a pretty hard sandstone. And so to get, they wanted to still get this quarter inch in five, and we were well over double the required capacity. In fact, the initial pile penetration was 45 feet. We had capacity right out of the gate at the very beginning of the PDA. And what was also interesting, there were other instances where we stopped pile driving on this job where the stresses got too high or we were well over capacity. And uh, one of my staffers took the gauges off and he goes, yeah, they kept driving after we stopped our PDA test because they wanted to get the quarter inch and, and I'm like, well, they what? And uh, I couldn't convince them not to do that, believe it or not. So here's another uh, quick example, 20 inch uh, diameter pipe pile, closed ended. In this case, they, they could have considered time dependent capacity increases. Um, and if you look at this arrow, that's where, the, that's where plan tip elevation was. So we're looking for 252 kips. So on initial drive, we're in the low 200s. Had they done uh, a restrike, at least a 24 hour restrike test, they would have made their plan links work out. But there was no provision for a PDA restrike on this job and so the piles all ended up going long until they basically went to bedrock to get capacity. So another uh, missed opportunity there. Okay, and this is, we're talking about IGM. So we got HP 14 by 117 piles and uh, the red line is the top of the weathered shale. And the, uh, you can see the, the figures for the uh, pile links. I mean, they had them going 50 feet below the bedrock contact. And of course we had a lot of experience in this area and we knew from previous uh, tests in the area, there's no way you're gonna get 50 feet into this thing. And on this particular job, contractor wasn't going to get paid for cutoffs. So we said, you know, you're gonna be uh, at a much shallower installation depth. And we, we estimated it was only to take 20 feet of penetration into the weathered shale. And uh, he reduced his pile links accordingly and, and that's how it shook out. So the red line is the top of the shale contact and you can see we're a penetration depth of 30 at that point and we ended up about 50. So 20 feet of penetration, just as we said, and of course we're pushing a thousand kips already. There, could you imagine going another 30 feet into the, I mean, it's just impossible. But again, it's because of the compartmentalized nature of a lot of this work. You know, the designers are, are using their static analysis methods and it would seem to me they don't have the benefit in, in many of these cases of having uh, been on job site where pile was installed for these particular locations or perhaps didn't have a background in, in pile uh, installation testing. So to sum it up, PDA can really be your friend. I'm not 
saying that because we provide PDA services. There's times, plenty of times where I tell people you don't, you could forego the restrike test as an example if we're well over capacity on an initial drive. Again, don't use the term refusal because it's, it's absolutely meaningless in my opinion. And there's an opportunity to optimize your design before you issue plans for bid. If you can bring somebody in who has a background in both design and testing and just do a quick constructability review on your, on your pile uh, design, I think it could pay a, a lot of dividends. And again, leverage your historical uh, data. You know, KDOT's doing that. We saw the presentation earlier with Jason on the, the sister projects. I know KDOT's uh, definitely w one of the organizations that's doing this, and uh, it, it's quite beneficial. So I wanted to allow some time for questions. Are, are there any questions? Okay, John. Thank you.